Hi skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. Welcome to another episode of Top 5 Fridays. Today is October 16th, 2020. Yes, we are still in the year 2020. Um, we'll get right into the news this week, but before I do, check out the most recent comparison video if you haven't already. We now have three 2021 comparison videos up. You guys really seem to like the comparison videos. Bob and I have a lot of fun putting them together. Um, pretty exciting and, and pretty just, just fun for us to stand up here and talk about skis for that long. Pretty much what we do anyways, even when there's a cam not a camera on us. Um, so glad you guys enjoy those. Next week we'll be going narrower. Um, we've had a lot of requests for front side and kind of mid-80 all-mountain skis. So that's what we'll be doing next. Um, and without further ado, let's get into the news. Um, first topic of the week is the FIS World Cup season starts this weekend in Solden. Um, pretty exciting. You know, we, uh, we uh, more, more World Cup ski racers, but we kind of navigated a lot of uncertainties over the off season, you know, pretty much every week in Top 5 Fridays, we were talking about something to do with ski racing and the variables and the uncertainties that those people were having to go through. I know that ski racers are really excited to get back to racing um, as a, a fan of ski racing i'm excited that they're back to racing um, and hopefully you know hopefully once these racers kind of get back in a routine that's it's a little bit easier for them um, i think they're kind of used to being in that routine rather than the the unknown of, of navigating the world of COVID 19. Um, so yeah, we have two GS races. We have women's giant slalom on Saturday and men's giant slalom on Sunday. There will be no Michaela Schifrin in this race as we reported on already, I believe. Um, but she tweaked her back a couple weeks ago and pulled out of Solden. Um, hopefully we have her back soon. Uh, the next race I believe is like the second week in November. So a little bit of a break between Solden and the next stop. So. Hopefully Michaela heals up and, and we get her for the next race. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty excited to watch some ski racing this weekend. Um, should, be, should be fun. I always really, really enjoy watching those races. Um, second topic of the week is Colorado has kind of published their official COVID, COVID guidelines going into the winter. Um, and they have a new proposal that kind of caught our attention and, and is something that we thought was pretty interesting. Um, overall, these guidelines pretty much align 100% with what we've seen from Vail um, and, and other ski resorts in terms of how they will be operating. Um, what really jumped out to us is Colorado has made a proposal that resorts will need to block off a certain amount of their lodging in case a visitor contracts the virus while they're on vacation. So this is actually up for a vote. I'm pretty sure it's this afternoon, which right now it's 12.07 in Colorado. Um, so I would imagine they'll be voting on this pretty darn soon. So we should know for sure. But essentially the idea, you know, that this came out of just the general question of what happens if somebody's on vacation and they, and they catch, catch the virus. Um, now, this is kind of the this is their suggestion and what they think would be safer than having that person go home um, but what it would require is resorts would have to block off some of their lodging for what they're calling isolation housing um, which is pretty interesting um, now you know we'll know for sure if, if resorts are going to have to do this um, by the end of the day today but definitely would be challenging for you know there are some resorts with a ton of lodging like i'm thinking about like the vales and the breckenridges of the world i feel like it'd be pretty easy to do at a place like that you know you'd kind of take like take something take a hotel complex that was a little bit off site and maybe like block off an entire floor of that or something like that um, but there are definitely smaller resorts that still get a significant amount of tourism um, where it would be much more challenging to do this. And then it erased, there, it, it brought up kind of some questions in my mind, like, 
you know, who's responsible financially for like their food and all that stuff. Um, so pretty interesting. I imagine a lot of those questions will come up during the voting process. Um, so we will definitely keep an eye on or, or an ear on this rather um, and, and let you know what happens or, or what comes of it. Um, but I don't, I, I think it makes, like to me it makes sense. You know, I'm no epidemiologist and, and I'm glad that I'm not, uh, but to me th this makes, makes a lot of sense and I think it's something that, that is doable. Um, third topic of the week, I gu I'm guessing that you have heard of this already because it's been bouncing around and, and coming up on a lot of different kind of ski news, social media sites and stuff like that. Uh, the Fisher factory in Europe um, sustained a pretty big fire. Um, so the, it's the largest, largest ski factory in Europe. Um, it, it's absolutely massive. I think it's like 22 hectares or something ridiculous. Um, a absolutely huge. Um, now, it doesn't just make Fisher. This is, this is a massive, massive factory. They make Fisher skis. They make skis for Scott. They make some skis for Stokely. They make some skis for Rossignol. There's like eight or nine brands that they make skis for. They also make snowboards. They also make hockey sticks. They also make running shoes. Um, now, what we know from the, from the articles that have been released on it so far is that they, will, they were able to contain it and stop it from spreading to the warehouse part. So that's really good in terms of like existing inventory. Um, and then we have heard from our own internal sources that the bulk of the damage was done in basically the part of the factory that's responsible for finishing. Um, so, you know, ski finishing is the type of stuff like base grinds and edge bevels and stuff like that. So if that's, you know, we, we don't know for sure, but this is what we're hearing. Um, so we thought we would share with you guys. And to me, that's good. Um, you know, if from my knowledge of ski factories and seeing them firsthand, how they work, it's better for them to be losing that stuff than to be losing the equipment on the other side of the spectrum. So if they were if they lost like their tooling instruments, like their ability to make their own molds, that is huge and like not really something that you can affordably outsource. Um, same could be said with ski presses. Like if all of their ski presses burned and were damaged, that would be really bad in my opinion. Um, so my hope as somebody who skis on some of these brands and, and you know, we sell a lot of these brands, my hope is that it won't slow their production. Um, and it's also, this was my first reaction to this was that it's like, you know, it's never good to have a factory burned down, but the timing is pretty good. Um, production runs on 2021 skis are all but finished. Um, and really, you know, they wouldn't be, they don't need to be producing next year's skis at least for a little while. So for us as skiers, between the fact that we heard it's damaging more of the finishing, finishing instruments um, and the time of year that it is right now, I am hopeful that it won't have a drastic effect on ski production. Um, but time will tell and we will continue to reach out to our sources um, and, and let you know if we hear anything else. I foolishly left my fourth piece of paper over there, so sorry about the, the quick break there. Uh, fourth topic of the week is the value of snow farming. Um, so we've talked about snow farming quite a bit, especially over the past like year. Um, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more popular in the past like one, two years. Um, last spring, we reported on a lot of different resorts doing some snow farming. I think it's really cool. Um, I've seen it work in places like Woodward out in, uh, out in Copper in Colorado. Um, and I, th I just think it's really cool, you know, and it also like saves money and resources on the other end of the spectrum. If you don't have to, if you don't have to blow enough, blow as much snow to kind of get your season going, 
um, you know, you're saving energy costs and, and saving water and, and all that stuff. Um, so, sweet, I'm going to mess this up. Sweden's Idre Fjall. Uh, um, I, uh, as usual, I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation. Um, but they have officially reopened as of today using only snow that was snow farmed. Um, and it's really cool. The images that, we've, that I've seen and, and that I'll put right there, um, the images of this is, is, in my opinion, just really, really cool. Um, you know, a cat basically just like pushing snow down from the top down um, and covering a significant amount of, of surface area, so to speak. Um, a couple other resorts are also benefiting from it. Levy and Rucka in Finland. Um, and then Krit, Kritvjell in Norway is another one. So really cool to see snow farming, um, you know, see it working, see it having a significant benefit to these resorts. Um, so, yeah, I, I love that kind of stuff. And, and anything that allows people to get on snow sooner than later uh, is just fine by me. Um, and then finally, we have our edits of the week. Uh, this first one is, is awesome. This one kind of gave me chills when I watched it because I'm a big fan of this, this skier. Um, it's Henrik Harlow's Salute trailer. Um, most of the skiing in this movie is going to be Henrik, but generally you see a handful of other athletes as well, and that's how it looks in the trailer. I'm pretty good at picking out skiing styles and knowing who it is. Um, so more than just Henrik in the trailer, some unbelievable skiing if you're into kind of backcountry freestyle and that kind of stuff. Um, next up is a short film called Action Men from the guys at Legs of Steel. Um, really, really good. You know, I, I expect this kind of quality from the Legs of Steel guys. They've put out some really, really good stuff in recent years. Um, and what I like most about this is there's some like pretty good stop motion um, which is something that I've always wanted to play around with more. Um, so it's a combination of some really cool stop motion animation and a bunch of, of really, really good skiing. Um, next up, we have a point of view video of the first ascent of the Liberty Bell Mountains North Face um, from Michael Schaefer. So pretty cool, super steep, super gnarly line. Uh, that stuff always impresses me and, and makes me nervous watching it because uh, I don't generally ski stuff with that much risk. Um, so pretty darn cool and, and hats off to Michael Schaefer for doing that. Uh, and then finally we have an edit called Powder Hunting in the Alps from Marcus Etter. Um, Marcus Etter is just a, a pleasure to watch ski always. Really, really good mix of yeah, like some freestyle influence in his skiing with just like unbelievably good fundamentals and, and really, really strong skiing technique. Um, so check out all of those. That's Top 5 Fridays for this week. Uh, sorry we missed one last week. Hopefully that was okay with you. Um, I'm still trying to get Bob back in here for these as much as I can. I do believe we will have more of Bob starting next week. Uh, basically some COVID protocols with his kids' school and Bob's been doing a lot of a lot of homeschooling for his three daughters, uh, which is a handful, but if anyone can handle it, it's Bob. Um, so that's it. Thanks for joining us as always, and we'll talk to you soon.